people are always asking their politicians for things. They want you to vote a certain way. <laughs> they want you to pass a, a license for their business, maybe. Like, they want a favor, you know? <laughs> and, and so of your constituent requests shifted over the past, you know, month or two? I think the biggest thing that we have seen is um, a, a total and necessary conversation around rent forgiveness and the importance of paying your rent versus being able to buy food. Mm. And in, in my community, and then you see this in Highland Park a lot, and the way that our community is built, there's a lot of mom and pop two residential properties, right? So it's like a front house and a back house. Yeah. You rent the back house and it helps pay for the mortgage. The conversation that needs to happen on a federal level is a mortgage forgiveness program so that small mom and pop owners can actually work out the deals with their tenants and their rents to be able to not have their, for their home foreclosed on. It was just a few years ago that we went through the foreclosure crisis across the country we can't afford our communities can't afford uh to go through that process again and there is no um there hasn't been a, a real actual conversation around that and i think that's important and we need to push our congressional leaders to actually lead on that effort not only for residential but for commercial property yeah i bet that there is a restaurant down the block from where you live that you love to go to a local coffee shop right that has to shut down during this pandemic, mm -hmm. that can't afford to pay their commercial rent, that uh, property owner perhaps can't afford to pay their commercial property, that coffee shop owner is probably also a resident who can't afford to pay their rent or pay their mortgage. Like these are real legitimate things that the city doesn't have total jurisdiction on, the county doesn't have jurisdiction over, and neither does the state. The federal government needs to figure this out. And not just for the big corporations, but for everyday Americans that need help. So in my case, it's El Huarache Azteca. Uh, hey, I love that place. I love that place. Um, there's a plaque that I signed on the wall. I want you to see it. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little disheartening to hear those words. It's up to the federal government. Uh, because nowadays, that seems to be the arm of government or the layer of government that is sort of least responsive, least prepared. I've been very excited about mayors and governors, and specifically my mayor and my governor, a little less uh -huh. so uh, what's happening out of the White House. Is, is there a way or an ask that you would have of people watching this, especially people in your area, to help light a fire you know, under that uh -huh. federal government or in any other way uh, provide more support to the community where you're seeing that need? Well, um, there's, there's certainly the best way is to advocate directly with your member of Congress and with our U.S. senators. So Senator Kamala Harris has actually introduced um, some ideas around legislation for credit card forgiveness, mm. right? The credit card moratorium. So again, credit cards, interest rising up. What about if you have lost all your income and you have automatic payments and now you're having to pay overdrawn fees out of your bank? There's that. Um, and really, if you are a, a homeowner, uh, advocating for a mortgage relief program, which uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters has proposed as well. Um, our congressman in the 34th Congressional, um, that, who represents Highland Park in these communities, Jimmy Gomez, has done the same. And so, one, it's an issue of getting a hold of their offices and saying, I support this, I need you to help us move this. Yeah. What do you need from us? How many, how many calls can we get? And who do we need to pressure and build additional support towards? Um, because these are not... There's no easy answer, but there are answers that need to come from the federal government because the city, the county, and the state can only do so much. Yeah. Um, how are how are you bearing the pressures, the unique pressures, of this time as a as a citizen, as a resident, and <laughs> a, as a representative? There are different pressures, Bertunde. For example, like um, I'm the eldest of five daughters. Uh, three of my sisters have lost their jobs, so they. The financial loss of income is, is very real. My parents are 61, and they are both essential workers. And we worry about them every day, them leaving the house, having to go to work, coming back home, and we try to be as helpful as possible. And there are countless families that have essential workers at every different level, whether it's frontline at a hospital or essential at a supermarket. 
um, this is a very real conversation about how we value human dignity and human life. Um, and I think that's a, a large, a large part of the of the conversation that we that we need to have. And how do we shift following this? There was a photo that I saw on Facebook that was so incredibly telling. Somebody took a photo of a homeless individual, um, just like laid out on the street outside of a restaurant with a patio where the people were just eating and having a good time. And here's this human being like just passed out, uh, who clearly needed help um, right outside of it. And the, the caption said, we were broken before COVID-19. And that, like, look, I'm getting chills just thinking about it because that I think is, is at the end, like, really, how do we change? How do we shift the economic perspective to include everybody and to really have justice for all people? Do you have any ideas? I do have some ideas. <laughs> Actually, I think there are some ideas that we could do here in the state of California. One of them is, is addressing the issue of homelessness and mental health. Uh, the issue of jobs. Look, I'm wearing a shirt that says. Well, <laughs> yes. You still there? Okay. You're you're so <laughs> fast on the recovery. Um, so you get points know, for for your own speed. Go ahead. So tell Thank me about this you. shirt. Yes. Uh, so this shirt, school not prisons, right? We all believe in a uh, in um, a cr criminal justice reform and ensuring that we uh, shift the conversation around that. But as we have, as we work towards ensuring that people are back home in their community there has to be a safety net that we talk about education and jobs because otherwise what we're doing is just creating um, additional folks that could potentially be homeless if you come back home mm. to communities like highland park that have changed dramatically in the last few years and your family is no longer here where do you go if you're coming back to east l.a you're coming back to echo park you're coming back to communities that no longer look the same perhaps when you went in and there are no jobs and there are there's no place that you can afford to live because rent is above $2,000 and you have no skills, then how is the society helping you? Yeah. So there has to be a deep conversation about investment in that. We still spend uh, more on incarceration than we do on education. And this generation of students, imagine you being a second grader right now and you're learning how to read and all of a sudden you can't and you're home and you don't have the resources anymore. How is that second grader ever going to catch up? The statistic is that if you cannot read by third grade reading level by that age, we would lose you into a system. That's like a harsh reality. How do we create this pandemic has also uh, allowed for us to see that we have a shortage of doctors, we have a shortage of nurses, we have a shortage of practically everything, and the, and the population doesn't measure to that. So how do we shift that? How do we invest in the things that matter? Um, and I think that's a conversation that the state certainly can have, but would require, I think, a deeper investment uh, across the country. Yeah.